Now, we've got Congressman Jamie Raskin. Thanks so much for coming back on. My pleasure. So let's go into the the latest uh, court case, this Colorado case. A Colorado judge has issued two rulings in the 14th Amendment case regarding Trump being disqualified from the ballot that Trump did incite an insurrection and also that the ban doesn't apply to presidents. So I want to take on the second part first. Do you agree with Judge Wallace's ruling that the language about banning officers of the United States doesn't apply to a president of the United States? I totally do not uh, agree with that. Um, you know, you would have to believe that the framers of the 14th Amendment specifically banned people from becoming electors for president and vice president, that is, being in the electoral college, but not banning the president himself or herself. Um, it just makes no sense. The president is the person who, as we saw on January 6, 2021, poses the most danger if he decides to overthrow the constitutional order and seize the presidency. So um, there's no textual exclusion for the president. The language is written in as comprehensive a way as possible. Um, and it seems clear to me that the framers of the 14th Amendment uh, wanted to sweep in the president along with members of Congress, members of the Electoral College, um, you know, and any other civil or military office. It just seems sweeping and comprehensive. And there would be no logic for saying that it shouldn't apply to the president when the president is potentially the most dangerous actor and has the resources at his disposal as the commander in chief of the armed forces in times of insurrection and, um, in times of war. So um, I don't agree with that. I, I do think that Judge Wallace um, uh, did reason properly when it came to Trump having uh, actually participated in insurrection. And that's just an airtight and detailed and comprehensive part of the opinion. And she herself says that, you know, it might sound preposterous to say that it shouldn't cover the president, but that was her reading, and it's all based on the idea that the president takes an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution, whereas other people take an oath to support the Constitution. And Section 3 says that um, n nobody shall hold an office um, who has um, previously taken oath um, to support the Constitution. And so that's a very thin read. To hang it on. Obviously, swearing to uphold and defend the Constitution is swearing to support the Constitution. Right. Well, but, can you talk about why Section 3 of the 14th Amendment was put in place originally? Because I think the, the history here is especially important. Yeah, I mean, the history is revealing. Um, this is right after the Civil War. It's during the Reconstruction period. There were Confederates um, all over the South, former Confederates, who were planning a restoration of their power um, and uh, wanted to get back into office. And originally, the, the legislative history is fascinating because originally the House uh, wrote a Section 3 that was far more sweeping, and it said that anybody who participated in insurrection shall not be allowed to hold office or vote again at all. And when it got over the Senate, they said, that is way too broad. We want to zero in on the bullseye core of people who really pose the greatest danger to the Republic. And so um, they said, we're not going to make it about suffrage and franchise. We'll make it about uh, holding office. And it will um, only be those people who actually held office before, uh, swore an oath, and then violated the oath by engaging in insurrection or rebellion. So you can see how it got dramatically drastically whittled down. But Donald Trump is right there in the center of the bullseye court. Right. I mean, to your exact point earlier, if the authors of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment went to all the trouble of preventing those who've engaged in or aided in insurrection from taking office, why would they also make the conscious decision to include who you said would be the most powerful person in office uh, to exclude them from, you know, from, from this exact uh, same provision? I mean, you'd have to believe that they thought that Jefferson Davis could have served as president of the United States after the war, or Judah Benjamin, or you know someone who had been uh, a vice president um, in the Confederacy. Um, and uh, it just makes no sense. I mean, John Breckinridge was a guy from Kentucky who was a U.S. senator 
before the war. He was vice president before the war, and he was um, expelled from the Senate for treason. On this theory, um, you know, had he been um, well, I guess as vice uh, as senator, she would say he'd be covered. But if he had just been vice president or president, she'd say he wouldn't be covered. And it, it just seems incoherent. I mean, it almost makes me believe that. Well, maybe she was on the fence and she was ambivalent and she decided at her level of the courts is just too much not only to find that Trump had engaged in insurrection, thus agreeing with the House of Representatives, agreeing with a majority of the Senate, agreeing with the January 6th committee, but also that he would actually be denied a place on the ballot. And she may have just punted and said, let's, I'm going to leave this up to the Colorado Supreme Court. Well, okay, to, to that exact point, um, this judge, Judge Wallace, said just a few weeks back that she was concerned about her own safety. So to what extent do you believe that Trump's intimidating tactics, for example, may have influenced her decision here? Yeah, I, I was not aware of that, Brian. So uh, that, that's alarming um, that she said that. Look, um, you know, we're living in a time of violent threats, death threats, actual, you know, people like Paul Pelosi. Um, being assaulted and beaten up. Um, and um, so that intensifies the climate for uh, decision making. And we are talking about him having participated in the insurrection. So that's serious business. I mean, there were more than 140 police officers who were wounded with broken fingers, broken toes, legs, noses, jaws, you name it, heart attacks, mace in the face, bear mace. Um, so, um, you know, th that may have figured into it, but it's also just possible that she thought, look, um, this is going to be appealed regardless of what I do. And maybe she could contribute most by offering a really meticulous factual recitation of what happened, not just on January 6th, but in the weeks leading up to January 6th, because of course the constitution here talks about um, insurrection um, against the Constitution, not insurrection against the, the government. Um, and Donald Trump was trying to overthrow the constitutional order and the 2020 presidential election for weeks. He was trying to do it in the states. He was trying to do it with state officials like Brad Raffensperger in Georgia. He was trying to do it at the Justice Department. Then, of course, it all came down to trying to force um, Vice President Pence to step outside of his constitutional role and essentially just declare Donald Trump the victor or kick it into the House for uh, a contingent election. But the, the bottom line is that he, you know, nobody has ever ruled this way before and no president has ever done this before. It is a case of first impression. And so she may have thought, well, I'm going to leave it to the Supreme Court to make the final analysis. Well, that that's actually was my next question is how much weight are you giving this given that it's already been appealed to the Colorado Supreme Court and will most likely end up at the U.S. Supreme Court anyway? Well, you know, deference is given to the fact-finding judge, the district court judge on the facts. It would be a pretty radical statement for either the Colorado Supreme Court or the U.S. Supreme Court to overturn the facts as opposed to change the law. So again, I think that Wallace has done the country a big favor in having a very meticulous presentation of the different witnesses, who was credible, who was not credible, um, and her best reconstruction of what happened leading up to January 6th. And then Donald Trump's very clear incitement of the mob to go and fight like hell where you're not going to have a country anymore. Um, so I thought she did an excellent job on that. And the other thing is is a case of first impression with respect to an issue of law. And so the Colorado Supreme Court was going to have to rule on it one way or another, and the U.S. Supreme Court will have to rule on that one way or another. And the question is, you know, I don't think it's remotely ambiguous or inscrutable. I just think it's clear, it's comprehensive. But if you were to think it was any kind of a tie of, um, you know, interpretive methodology, surely... Um, the tie has got to go to constitutional democracy, by which I mean not what Trump's people are saying, which is, well, just let the voters decide. No, it's got to go to constitutional democracy in the 
determination of the framers of the 14th Amendment to disqualify people who've been in office and then tried to destroy the republic. Now, while this case is working its way through the courts, uh, Donald Trump has been on the campaign trail himself, echoing language used by the most vile dictators in history. So what was your reaction to Trump echoing the likes of Hitler and Mussolini by vowing to root out his opponents, um, whom he called vermin? Well, it's all unvarnished now. Um, they understand that um, Trump's not bringing over um, any moderate voters anymore. You know, there, there are very few swing voters. I mean, it's not like there are 7 million people um, who voted for Biden who are going to change their minds. And, you know, Biden beat Trump by 7 million votes. And so it's not like there's 7 million people saying, oh, that Trump guy, well, he really deserves second chance, you know? Yeah. Um, so what that means is that uh, Trump is throwing caution to the winds. I mean, he is waging war on um, the federal courts, on the state courts, on district attorneys, on the rule of law, on the justice department. Um, he's set himself at war against our whole constitutional system and has repeatedly said that, you know, it's more important that he get back in office than that we would follow the dictates of the Constitution and has called for it to be set aside repeatedly. Um, so, you know, the best one could hope for in um, a Donald Trump return to power would be something like Putin. But he's also talking about, you know, setting up camps for undocumented immigrants for 10 million people in the country, mass roundups and deportations. Um, he's calling his political enemies vermin, and he's openly saying that he is going to weaponize the Department of Justice and unleash prosecutors on people who he thinks are beating him in the polls. Um, he seems to think that he's going to be uh, running endlessly, as well as assuming, of course, that he's going to win. Um, which seems like an unthinkable outcome from the standpoint of the survival of democracy and um, our country. Not asking you to do the impossible and get in Donald Trump's pe head, but what do you what do you presume is the strategy here by virtue of kind of doubling down on the same kind of rhetoric that would presumably uh, alienate all of those people in the middle who he'd need to actually win? Or is it just to really double, triple down on his base and hope that they're as energized as possible so that they actually end up going to the polls and just hoping that there's depressed turnout on the left? Yeah, they don't have a majority strategy. They have a strategy of galvanizing their base, turning them out, and then suppressing other votes through um, unlawful and lawful means. Uh, gerrymandering as many districts as possible, uh, installing and then exploiting uh, the right-wing pro-Trump judges um, in the federal judiciary. Um, they learned a lesson from Bush versus Gore, of course, uh, about the Supreme Court intervening to stop the counting of ballots. Um, and so, you know, it will be... Um, well, they anticipate hand-to-hand -hand combat um, in the streets, but it will certainly be um, a, a massive litigation struggle all over the country as they try to disqualify voters, um, drive people from the polls, challenge voters. Um, you, you notice that the Voting Rights Act has been dismembered in Shelby County versus uh, Holder. The preclearance requirement is essentially gone, and now they're taking after Section 2. Um, so they really do want to thoroughly trash the Voting Rights Act, so it's just not a factor anymore. Um, and they have, um, you know, made it very difficult to sue constitutionally to vindicate the right to vote, which of course is not a textual right that applies to everybody. What we have is anti-discrimination amendments like the 15th and the 19th. Moving over to the House, uh, Speaker Johnson has now indicated that he's throwing his support behind the Biden impeachment effort because, uh, well, because apparently he enjoys the masochism. So what was your reaction to hearing that that the abject humiliation that was this impeachment effort just got Speaker Johnson's blessing? Well, I mean, he's got a, a four vote majority. Um, if and when uh, George Santos goes next week, that's down to a three vote majority. Uh, we've seen repeatedly it's ungovernable um, on the Republican side. And so he, you know, like his predecessors, is just selling off large parts of the farm. And so 
there are people who want to pursue the um you know Im- impeachment theater of the absurd uh but there of course is nothing there you know after thousands and thousands of pages of documents and bank records and suspicious activity reports they haven't laid a glove on joe biden um and um everything seems to be you know blowing up in their face they just keep stepping on the rake no matter where they go um so it doesn't trouble us except that um at a time of so many serious problems um in the world in our uh country we could be doing real legislation there's real work that could be done i mean the gun violence crisis alone um should be commanding our attention after yet another nightmare of a massacre in maine um but the republicans just don't want to do anything thoughts and prayers but uh no action and no legislation well to that exact point we are now a year out what's your plan to convince an electorate that that is looking more and more hesitant to back joe biden and the democrats in 2024 i mean i think that people um have to get over the idea that with a president we're picking you know a leading actor for a movie or something like that i mean you're picking a president a vice president a cabinet a political party to move into the future and they just got a great record in terms of the bipartisan infrastructure act 1.2 trillion dollar infusion of money into the bridges and the roads and the highways and the ports and the airports and the metro stations and rural broadband and you know high speed internet i mean the the democrats did that and the chips and science act and the inflation reduction act dramatic reductions in prescription drug costs for people in medicare I, I had um, constituents who were spending $1,000 a month for their insulin shots, and now it's capped at $35 a month. And we did that without any Republican votes. So people have got to think programmatically about where we're going uh, as a country. We just did two contrasting public philosophies. On the one side, you've got Joe Biden, who really is anchored in the New Deal, the Great Society, the civilizing movements of our time, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the LGBTQ movement. And he believes with our party that the government must be an instrument for the common good of all. And then you've got Donald Trump, who believes that the government is an instrument of private money making for the president, his family, and his private corporations. And it's just an absolute ripoff. Um, And that puts us in the company of the the plutocrats and the kleptocrats um from all over the world and you know the autocrats and the theocrats i mean that's the coalition of people conspiring against the common good that the democrats have to stand against and the good news though is that we are a big majority hillary beat him by two and a half million votes biden uh beat him by uh seven million votes we have another 12 to 15 million young people coming um uh, onto the roles, and our job is to connect with them, to listen to them, to hear them, to participate with them, to get them engaged in politics as quickly as possible. Because we got to defend our freedom, we got to defend our democracy, and we've got to get back to work again on climate change, which is the overhanging nightmare that we need to confront. Perfectly put, as always. Let's let's finish off with this. This interview is being recorded just before Thanksgiving because, um, well, because I've been doing my show for a few years now, and uh, I'd be more likely to get drafted into the NFL this week than land an interview the Friday after Thanksgiving. So, uh, do you have any plans for Thanksgiving? Well, yes, indeed. I mean, we, you know, our family um, it goes to my sister's house, and so my sister is a is a brilliant hostess, and so she has twenty five members of our family. Um, and uh, every year I bring a, a surprise guest, so I've got a really good surprise guest for them, but I can't tell you, well, but you I'll can, tell you this, after Thanksgiving. I was going to say, this isn't coming out until until after Thanksgiving, so you can, I mean, I'll be the only person that knows if you want to reveal All it. All right, well, let, let's, um, let, well. Um, you, don't, you don't have to, you don't have to. <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you afterwards, but you, you'll, it'll definitely pique your interest, so. Okay. Could call me on Friday and then uh, <laughs> it's still uh, Congressman, happy Thanksgiving. Thanks so much for taking the time. Happy Thanksgiving to you, Brian, and to all of your uh, the, your great participants out there. 